Welcome to Still Speak, Episode 7 of my Summer Wells series. If you've not seen the first six episodes, please pause here and go give those a listen first because it would be helpful to you to better understand what we're discussing in this episode. And briefly, I want to say, just bear with me. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where it is best for me to record these in a home that is very busy and loud. Um, and my surrounding areas, apparently, because I've tried my car, and that works, but I'm sweating. <laughs> and you hear crickets, and you hear other people opening and closing their car doors. And I've tried my garage, but you hear my kids. And uh, now I'm in my backyard currently, and you may actually hear a little bit of water running in the background because of the pool filter. You may hear an air conditioning or a plane. I'm going to do my best to pause when there's a very loud noise, but I, I'm just trying to find where the best spot is. So just please be patient with me and not judge me. It's I've been really wishing I had a shed right now that I can kind of go in the back of the backyard and, you know, lock myself in there and put up you know, soundproofing stuff just to get this done, but I don't have that right now, so we gotta work with what we got. So, let's get back to it, okay? It would be far easier and a lot less time if, you know, I only made one or two episodes about this case, but it's just not my style. Not about cases that are this complex. If I cut it shorter, then I'm leaving too much out, and I feel like I wouldn't be staying true to myself. And in cases where there may not be that much depths to it, then of course it'll be much easier to cut them shorter and stick to the most important aspects. But don't despair, we're getting close to the end of the Summer Wells series, and I hope that we're also close to the end of Summer being missing too, and that she will be found soon, hopefully, of course, safely. Back to Don before proceeding to Candace. Um, at times I am going to be speaking about both at the same time because, well, they're married, so sometimes, you know, I need to speak about both. And, yep, there you go. It's a little, a little birdie who's trying to say hello to you. <laughs> I outlined some of the theories that involved Don, and I said that as of now, it's just not fitting or clicking for me. But just one piece of factual information or evidence can change, change that. Until then, though, that's where I stand. And it's, it's, of course, on the list of possibilities because anything is possible. When it was brought up on the interview channel about Don's history with his stepsister that we discussed in the last episode, it was brought up that Summer sleeps with her parents. And I have to comment on this because kids sleeping with their parents is not unusual. Yeah, even at five, it's it's common. And once a kid starts to sleep with you, whether it starts as a baby or as a toddler or as a young child, it's a hard habit to break. And you know, some kids end up sleeping with them for way longer than expected. It happens. It's, I know a lot of kids who have done that. I have two who did it my, you know, in my house. I understand that this was brought up as a way to link the sexual assault from his teenage years to possible sexually assaulting summer, but it alone doesn't mean much of anything. I, I know oftentimes people without children may you know, start to follow a case about a missing child, and they are sometimes unaware of what is normal or common with children. So I I just wanted to address this because it kind of bugged me. Again, I speak from personal experience and know of many kids who sleep with their parents. Not abnormal at all. This little bird in the background, he's a noisy little guy. Oh my goodness. He can kind of be relaxing, but not right now, bird. (laughs) <laughs> in Don's call with Chris, Don was asked what he thinks should happen to the person who did this to Summer. And Don originally uh, responded by saying that he was afraid that he was going to see them or get to that person first. And I understood this as basically saying, if I see him, I'm going to harm them or kill them. And, of course, that's scary because then you're going to jail. And Don is very well aware of how jail is. He has a criminal history. And if you watch any documentary, if you've never been to jail or prison, you know, people typically look at jail as, like, county, while you're waiting for trial, and prison as, you know, where you go after your trial. Sometimes it gets used interchangeable. But if you've ever watched a documentary about that, I mean, you know that it's not a walk in a park at sunset, right? It's it's not a good place by any means. And 
Somehow this answer got overlooked or intentionally ignored and the question was asked again where then Don goes on to basically say that it would be in God's hands, which if you're a Christian, you knew exactly what that meant. But both the host, Chris, and the public only harped on the second answer, not the first one, because there's nothing actually alarming about the first. Most parents would feel that way. I always said, you know, God help anybody, you know, who does anything to my kid because I'll be the one in handcuffs. You wouldn't even need a trial, right? I'd be like, what, what am I saying there? I'm saying that I'm going to harm or kill the person who, you know, harmed my child, right? Now, obviously, I don't know how I would react, but I think I would lose my mind for a hot minute and, you know, possibly do something completely unwise. But I don't know, and I definitely don't want to ever know. But I used to say that all the time, like, you're going to need the handcuffs for me, not them, right? So... Don saying, like, I'm afraid that I'm going to get to them first. I mean, that's a pretty understandable feeling, right? At least to me it is. You know, Don's not some well-educated, well-spoken, sophisticated, precise speaker. You know, he's not like Bill Gates or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or the president. Well, some presidents are not such great speakers, but anyways. <laughs> Candace and Don are both uh, not precise at all. And it leaves a lot of room for, you know, interpretations and speculating on what they say. And I think it's actually a huge reason why people find things they say as red flags. Um, but if they had spoken a little bit more clearly or more focused or more precise, then you may actually see, you know, less talk about what the parents say amongst the public. But unfortunately, that is what we're seeing. You know, both also speak in a way as if their home, their pasts, their current lifestyle is perfectly normal. And they often come across as confused as to why any, you know, anyone would question what they said or have done now or prior. It may not be normal to me or you, but it may be normal to them. So I can understand if they seem a little puzzled by the public's reaction to their lives. I've no doubt seen them talk in this confused manner, and they usually answer in a way that comes across as, what's the big deal? You know, like, why are you asking? Like, they almost have, like, this puzzled, like, we always do that. We always, we always, like, very confused as to why someone from the public thinks that something's odd or were strange and this can go back to what i said that they seem to be products of their environment and if so you know that can explain why their way of living is normal to them but it may not be normal to us even their area or their town or their city or the state can be that could be normal but for maybe other people in other states other countries other towns etc it may not be normal okay juicy sells as much as sex does i mean that's the reason why jerry springer and maury tmz or page six were so popular right juicy and gossip the more shocking or outrageous the more gossip the more rumors the better right this is why people cling to rumors so much they want it to be true because the rumor is shocking or outrageous and unfortunately, as I said in the last episode, the way the Wells look, where they live, what they live in, and how they live have been a huge part of this story. And this is a, a big part of why the story gained attention because it seems shocking or outrageous to the majority of the public who doesn't live in that way. And then people stereotype them and therefore believe they are guilty of harming their daughter. Here's how I see it. What's normal? I mean, who defines what normal is? You know, the Wells home definitely needs extensive work, for sure, and it's very uh, cluttered and needs to be decluttered. There's no doubt about it. Um, I didn't go inside, obviously, and was only able to see what a video camera would show me from a distance. The public said, you know, their home's filthy. But, I mean, I couldn't see filth in the video. I did see excessive clutter and mess, and... 
I would need to be inside the home to see whether or not there's actual filth. I mean, when I think of filth, I'm thinking like, I mean, you know, milk that's been left in the refrigerator for three years or caked up dirt on the walls and toilets and uh, soap scum in the shower that's just been sitting there for months on end. So I would need to go inside and look and see if it's actually filthy. You know, look closely at those things. Showers and toilets and floors and appliances and all those things. I mean, there definitely seems to be a lot of dangerous area for a small child like Summer, but anything can be dangerous when it comes to a small child. I mean, even their own little toys can be dangerous to them. Now, I'm not downplaying the environment in which these children live, but here's how I see it. There are children who live in tent cities and are homeless, living amongst criminals and pedophiles who have to, you know, go outside to take to go to the bathroom. And, you know, they have no shelter, very little food, they have no running water, and no proper sanitation. I don't know about you, but I would rather those children be living in a home like the Wells home. And I'm sure those kids wish they could too. So while it's not ideal by any means, in my opinion, it is a shelter. And it was hard to watch the video of the home. And personally, instead of judging them, what I kept thinking was, I wish I lived near them so I can go over and help them declutter and organize and remove all the garbage and junk from the property. You know, sometimes when something gets so out of control, like if you just keep ignoring your to-do list, right? And then now you have this huge to-do list because you've been ignoring it. Suddenly, that to-do list is just so overwhelming. You're like, oh, I'm not even going to bother. Like, I don't even want to now, right? Because it's overwhelming. And I don't know what the situation is. If they live like that because they think it's normal or they live like that because, you know, they, they it became that way. And then it got to the point that it was so bad that they just felt overwhelmed. They just couldn't find the time to get in there and do it or didn't want to be bothered with it I don't know I have no idea I just know for me like I have a huge list of things to do after this right and it's things that I've been procrastinating (laughs) um so when that happens and now I have this huge list I'm like oh oh you know what I mean because now it's like so much work same thing with like yard work if you don't keep up with it and now you have all these weeds and branches and leaves everywhere and um, you know, yard stuff everywhere, you know, things that happen naturally. And then now all of a sudden you have to clean it. You know, you're going to be like, oh, Lord, where do I even start? Right? <laughs> so this is where I'm going with that. I don't know why they live like that. And only they know why. But I can just say that it could be as simple as they just, the house got to a point that was just too much. And they just felt overwhelmed. I don't know. But if I live closer to them, I would definitely offer to go help them. I would. I definitely would. Because I'm not scared of them. Because I don't think that they are these horrific people that everybody's making them out to be. But let's continue. When Candace gave the tour of the house and recounted the story of Summer going missing to Chris, she put her and her family out there without any hesitation. And she did at one point say, you know, something to the effect of, it's not the most beautiful home, but it's a home, right? So there was a smidge of acknowledgement that the conditions were not the best. You know, but other people don't say think it's less than best. They think it's horrific, But she only looks at it as, well, it's not the most beautiful or the the best. She opened her home for the world to see, and I saw very little signs of shame for the condition of which, again, goes back to, I think that, you know, they mostly believe it's a normal way of living. And, you know, that can explain why there's not really any signs of shame. Let me tell you something. I don't live like in a house like that at all. I don't live in the country. My house is the condition of my home doesn't look like that. My house inside is not cluttered. It's not dirty. Okay. The majority of the time it's clean. It has its moments, right? When I just don't feel like doing something. And we do have a bunch of toys or clothes around because we have kids and that's what happens. And it gets cleaned up at the end of the day. And that's that. I'm not one who like follows my kids around constantly picking up after them. 
But if you showed up to my house uh, uninvited or on the fly asked if you can come over, uh, I'm either telling you no, you can't come over, or if you show up, I'm leaving your ass outside for at least an hour before I allow you in my house. And this goes for friends and family, too. My husband knows this. He knows I need advance notice, even if anybody's stopping by, even if it's just five minutes. Yet when Chris sprung this on Candace to go to the house, she didn't hesitate at all. She said, sure, like it was absolutely no big deal at all. So props to Candace that she did that because she didn't have to. And most people would have said no. I would have. I mean, that's just the fact. There has been a lot of assumption that they live the way they do because they don't have a lot of income. Now, you have people who don't have a lot of income who live very nicely, right? You have people who are rich who live poorly, okay? But, you know, this is said in a way like, you know, you know, they didn't spend money on material things. I mean, it could be why, and it could be, you know, that they're not really the type of people that focus on material things, like, you know, super nice fridge, nice flooring, um, fresh paint might not be things. I wouldn't even categorize those as materialistic, but my point is, is that these people might be the type of people who rather spend money on going places and doing things like vacations and taking the kids here or there or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what their situation is, but not everybody is into, you know, having a perfect home. You know, some people decorate over the top. Some people decorate bare minimum. Some people, you know, do a lot of housework. Some people don't. I mean, some people view a home as just where you kind of sleep and you're always gone anyway. So who cares? And I mean, let's look at the Watts case again, okay? They appeared well off. They they seemed to be, you know, in a large, somewhat brand new home, drove a nice car. The kids were always dressed to the nines, looking great in pictures, and attended a fancy daycare. Yet, they were in debt up to their eyeballs. And they could not sustain the lifestyle they were living in reality. So just because something appears one way doesn't mean that's what's actually going on. I don't know their finances, do you? I'm not going to make assumptions about their finances. I have friends who live in all sorts of homes. Okay? They do. Some people like to do projects. Others hire people. I can't afford to hire people, so I do things myself. And then that takes time. i got to find time to do it. So on and so forth. So this goes back to feeling overwhelmed if you have too much to do around your home specifically. When people look at Don and Candace's photos of the kids, they hone in or focus in on the pictures that are less than pleasant. You know, like one's a summer with dirt in her face or where she's dancing in the rain amongst kind of junk and is barefoot. You know, these kids live in a rural area. Playing in mud, dancing in the rain, being barefoot, climbing trees, wearing pajamas outside to go swing is all common occurrences. It is. You know, I have friends who live on land, and they got a lot of acres, and their kids, you know, they just run the land. Barefoot, playing, exploring, running around the woods and dirt piles, like it's nothing. You know, we visited a friend in Texas who has a lot of acres about two years ago, and it was actually really pleasant, because we don't live in the country, and it made me want to have a farm. (laughs) Because I could just let my kids go. You know, there's this um, uh, sense of you know, you don't have to be fearful, which stands out to me with this case. Because when you're in the middle of nowhere and there's nothing really around, not much around, you know, you don't really have to worry about cars driving by and hitting your kid. And you could kind of let them just run and play. And they're right there. And it's a big open field and you can see them. Now, the Wells home is not like a big open field, you know, and acres of land. I mean, it's acres of land, but it's, you know, it's got brush and trees and woods and creeks. Whereas my, my friend's farm is flat. It's flat land. So if your kid goes running way, way out, you could still see them because it's all flat land. But there's still this sense of, you know freedom (laughs) with your kids it's much more relaxed it's a false sense of security you know and my kids were playing in the mud and they even got in the water with the ducks 
that were swimming. They had like this little baby pond. And they went in the baby pond. I'm like, oh my god, you're in a baby pond with ducks. <laughs> it's a real tiny pond. I mean, I'm very overprotective of my kids, and even I let them do this. So anyway, point being is that this is like normal for people who live out on pieces of land, and I can definitely see having a false sense of security. When you live on a piece of property like that, because you're thinking, like, we're in the middle of nowhere, you know, there's not many people around, no big deal, right? So, it's scary. It's scary because, you know, you're not really safe anywhere. (laughs) So, you always have to be on alert. But it's easy to get into that relaxed mindset when you're on land like that. But anyway, let's move on from that. You know, there are pictures, though, where the kids are clean and they seem really well taken care of where they're out doing things like swimming and while they were on vacation and fall hay rides and church and fishing and visiting lakes and creeks. I mean, you can't just ignore those photos because it doesn't fit your opinion. Okay? They exist. You can't just pick and choose what you want to pay attention to. The difference with the wells and most people, let's say, on social media is that that most post fake pictures. They only post pictures if everything in that picture is perfect. You know, clean background, nothing laying out, perfectly cleaned and dressed kids with their hair all gelled up. And it's like this posed picture set as a stage and even at times includes props, right? Then there's people who are a little bit more real and just share candid pictures. The Wells didn't seem to hide or try to cover up or pretend to be perfect or something that they weren't. And they didn't seem to be too worried about maintaining an image. So they would just share pictures that most would not. You know, and just like they let Chris in the house and even other people when most people wouldn't. I mean, again, I sure as heck wouldn't. So, Summer appeared to be a happy little girl. Kids don't worry about messy house or clutter. If she's out there somewhere right now, still alive, I can absolutely assure you her current situation is a lot worse than than what it is back at her house. That is a fact. Don and Candace both have been accused of being current drug addicts. Um, Both do have prior history of drugs, but we don't know for sure if it's ongoing or current. And Don mentioned that Candace popped for weed when cops gave her a drug test after Summer went missing. But, listen, you know, weed is different than, let's say, crack. It's a natural plant. It actually has a lot of health benefits. Now, I don't smoke weed, okay? But I don't agree with it being on the same level as other drugs. So it's not alarming to me that she would smoke weed. I actually know a lot of adults who do it for the health benefits, especially for treating things like anxiety and depression, which so many of us you know, suffer from. It was also said by Hunter's mom, Allie, that Candace drank every night. I mean, I'm not saying that's okay, but a lot of people do. Was she drinking to get wasted every single night, or was she just having a drink or two before bed to unwind? I mean, I have friends who have wine every day after work. I need more clarification and more context, you know, if this is even true, to say whether or not you know, Candace has a drinking problem. I don't know. I mean, again, it might not even be true. We know there was an altercation in October of 2020 at the Wells' home, which involved drinking and cops being called. But, I mean, that's only one event, and that doesn't automatically mean this is, you know, a weekly or daily occurrence on their property. Most of us have a crutch, right? You know, what another person might deem bad. You know, we all have habits. You know, whether it's biting nails, smoking, drinking, weed, or binge eating, whatever. I have a bad habit. My crunch is, you know, I'm an off-again, on-again smoker. When I'm really stressed out, I'm going to buy cigarettes. So who am I to judge, right? Now, now, okay, if Candace had been on crack or meth or something of the sort that day, Summer went missing, this would be an entirely different discussion, right? (laughs) Of course it would. But... Weed? Eh. Eh. It's weed. I mean, eh. It was also mentioned recently that, by Don, that with everything that's going on since Summer went missing, that he had been drinking, and I can't blame him for that at all, can you? I mean, you will, if you think he's guilty. 
But if he's innocent, I mean, would you blame him if he got drunk every single night that his daughter's missing, not knowing where she is or what happened to her, or thinking about what the worst possible thing that happened to her, which would be, of course, being murdered? And he goes on to mention something about someone coming to the property, um, you know, maybe that there was some kind of altercation. I don't know. Again, Don's not a very clear or precise speaker, and he didn't clarify this. He kind of just threw this out there, and... He claims that this event of drinking and possibly somebody coming to the property is what led to um, their three boys being taken by CPS from the home about five to six weeks after Summer went missing. Yes, you heard that correctly. The three boys have been removed by CPS. Both him and Candace have said that the boys being removed doesn't have anything to do with Summer being missing But we actually have no idea why they were removed. I mean, that's just what he said. Information to, you know, related to the boys and why they were removed is going to be private because they're minors. You know, Don has said that they are safer where they are and he's happy that they're out of the house. And this really upset people. But I think that it's an understandable feeling. People have shown up to their house. They've made death threats and they have already have a kid missing and Lastly, I imagine that if, you know, both parents, if of course not guilty, are not mentally doing okay, right? So I can understand him feeling like they may be safer out of the house. CPS varies state to state and county to county. I know cases where there was little to no neglect or abuse and kids were taken on the first call. And I know other cases where there were years of abuse reported and nothing was ever done. We have no real way no- of knowing why they decided to remove the children. Um, we can only assume with all that's going on at the property, maybe the condition of the property, or something, you know, worse that we're unaware of yet might be why. But they do have lawyers, and they are working to try to get their boys back. And they both don't speak about the boys because they're wanting to not jeopardize Uh, getting them back and their lawyer actually advised them to not speak about the boys as well i want to go back to the story about don and his stepsister in his teen years because after recording the last episode and then after listening to some other channels there's i decided to look up the data and i found an article from the national center of sexual behavior of youth the ncsbi and they quote from the department of justice data The title says, Understanding Adolescents with Illegal Sexual Behavior. More often, such behavior is the result of many factors, and the following are the most common reasons. First is curiosity and experimentation. Most adolescents are curious about sex. It says some of them will take advantage of an opportunity to find out more with younger children. Impulsivity is the next one, slash immaturity. And here's a quote. Research tells us that all teenagers are immature and impulsive to some degree, but some teenagers are more immature and more impulsive than others, and some may be diagnosed with ADHD and have poor judgment about relationships and actions. ADHD does not directly cause problematic sexual behavior, but contributes Youth with impulsive behavior and poor decision-making skills are more likely to break rules, including rules about sexual behavior in risky situations. It's important to note that most youth with ADHD do not have problematic sexual behavior. Some teens have not matured socially and do not fit in with their age group, and they may tend to spend time with younger children as they are more comfortable with this age group. Now, this was really interesting to me because before even reading this, I said that we're all on different social emotional levels. I said when we're in our teens, we're all on different maturity levels. And here they're basically confirming what I said. Just because somebody's a teen, one 12 year old is not going to be the same as another 12 year old. Emotionally, you know, emotionally, socially, and, you know, maturity wise. It's just, it's not going to be that way. And that goes for 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Even as adults, we're all different, right? 
And but especially in our teen years, there's a different maturity levels. You know, when I was ten, I was babysitting my newborn baby brother. I couldn't let my ten year old do that. He's not on the same maturity level that I was at ten years old. So it varies. So I found this really interesting that they actually listed this as one of the reasons. The next one was delinquency um, and aggression. Some teens have a history of consistently breaking rules of behavior at home, at school, or in the community, they say, as they repeatedly engage in delinquent behaviors. And their illegal sexual behavior is one more delinquent act in a pattern of highly problematic behaviors. The next one is psychological problems. Quote, some boys who commit illegal sexual activities um, have serious psychological problems such as depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. The mental illness itself does not cause the illegal behavior, but it may affect their feelings, judgment, and choices. They may be isolated and feel left out of normal teen activities and turn to children as substitutes for age-appropriate relationships, unquote. The next one says exposure to sexual materials or behavior. Now, they go into, you know, in this day and age of social media and, um, you know, the internet, which, you know, Don's history with his stepsister was, you know, close to 40 years ago, so obviously they didn't have that stuff back then, so that doesn't really apply, but... It says at the bottom here under this category that some teens live in a highly sexual home with frequent open sexual behavior between adults. And this environment, too, can affect their choices and behavior. The next one says sexual abuse. Quote, some adolescents have themselves been sexually abused. The abuse might have been recent, might be ongoing, or it could be something that happened when they were much younger the majority of teens with illegal sexual behavior however have not been sexually abused unquote this is interesting because people are all going around going if he was you know sexually abusing that means he was sexually abused and this is saying that the majority are not you know also sexually abused some are but the majority is not So then it says the next one, problems with sexual attraction to children. Quote, one important thing to know is that youth under age 18 commit a substantial number of sex offenses committed in the United States. At least one third of all sexual abuse of children is committed by boys under 18. And at the bottom, there was questions and then answers. So here's some of the uh, answers that I uh, saved. Quote, current research shows that the majority of adolescents with illegal sexual behavior do not go on to become adult sex offenders. Unquote. Let me repeat that again for the people in the back. Okay? Quote, current research shows that the majority of adolescents with illegal sexual behavior do not go on to become adult sex offenders, unquote. That's so important, okay? Next one. Quote, most teenage boys have sexual activity with younger children that they know and spend time with. This includes younger siblings, cousins, children of a neighbor, or a child they babysat. It is unusual for an adolescent boy to have illegal sexual behavior with a child he doesn't know. Adolescents rarely abuse children they don't know. Unquote. Next one. Quote. The rate of future delinquent behavior in these teens, such as shoplifting or using illegal drugs or possessing stolen property and even non-sexual aggression, is significantly higher than the rate of future illegal sexual behavior. Parents need to be aware of the risk for other possible delinquent behaviors with these teens and provide close supervision of their friends and activities. 
Unquote. This is also interesting because it's saying that those who, as you know, an adolescent, they committed an illegal sexual behavior, they may actually go on to shoplift or use illegal drugs or you know, st- you know, stolen property and things like that over reoffending again sexually. And we know that Don Wells has a criminal history and includes some of those things. You know, he even talked about running drugs. So, there's that. Next one. Quote, Anywhere from 20 to 50% of teenage boys with illegal sexual behavior report being sexually abused as a child. Several studies have shown that previous physical and or psychological abuse or neglect may also play an important role. But many of these boys have not experienced at any past maltreatment, unquote. Okay? And at the bottom, he gave a list of tips. And the first one says, Most adolescents do not have future illegal sexual behavior. Next one. Adolescence is a developmental period of export, uh, experimentation and risk-taking, excessive self-focus, and evolving cognitive development next there is not one type or profile of adolescents who commit illegal sexual behavior next one adolescents are quite different from adults when it comes to illegal sexual behavior next one there are a variety of reasons why adolescents commit illegal sexual behavior last one Adolescent girls commit significantly fewer illegal sexual acts than boys. Now, I want to go back up for a second as I scroll up here for a hot minute. And it said up here that under the maturity, um, it says, and I found this really interesting. It said, under maturity, quote, they may tend to spend time with younger children as they are more comfortable in that age group. Unquote. Why did this catch my eye? Well, we talked about Hunter and how I said that I felt it was really odd that a 15-year-old boy in the middle of summer would want to go spend time with a 5-year-old girl. So it makes me question Hunter's maturity level. It does. Not as it relates to sexual behavior, but who knows, but as a whole, what his maturity level is. Well, I learned a few things from that, did you? If you're a parent, you definitely want to know this, right? Like I said, in most cases, you can learn something from it that could be helpful in your own life. You know, and that's all I have for now. I'll see you again in episode 8.